In this interview, it's all about the intimacy of macro with Karen Hutton. This is Twit. Welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, I have one of my dearest friends on the hot seat, Miss Karen Hutton. She's been on the show before. Yep, she's been on the show before. We always have a good time talking about all things photography. Today is not going to be uh, an exception to that rule, but today we're going to niche down into macro photography macro getting close taking a peek inside worlds unseen <laughs> we're gonna get a look at karen's unique approach to macro photography and i say unique because spoiler alert it doesn't involve you know uh getting into the technical weeds although she does that it doesn't involve getting into the technical weeds it's more about the art which is what i love about karen hutton karen welcome to the Frederick, show you thank you I just interrupted you, just like I always do. <laughs> just stepping on my feet, left and right. Look at you. <laughs> how are you doing? Let's let's do before we dive into this macro discussion. How the heck are you doing? Are you I'm hanging doing good. in there? You look great. You sound great as usual. What is yeah. the deal? It was, you know, it's been a tough year, just like it has been for everybody. But uh, yeah. you know, it's a time of making new decisions and deciding what's really important and you know what you want to how you want to really show up and serve. And so those are some of the decisions I've been making. And uh, yeah, and so I feel energized and ready to go. Yeah, yeah, I you know, I've, I agree with you 100% because it's, you know, we're all just kind of, I feel like we're all just laying the bricks for the road as we step on them, you know, and nobody has all the answers, but it's all good. The good thing about all this is as a creative professional, there's we have this outlet that we can channel our frustrations or energy into and especially in a time like this where we're uncomfortably separated from others macro photography makes a whole heck of a lot of sense you know exploring worlds unknown that you probably would overlook on a day when you can go out and do shots of El Capitan or something right so tell me let's start with that Karen what is your what is sort of your worldview about micro worlds. <laughs> <You know? laughs> What's my world of micro worlds? Well, I have always loved um, macro photography and I actually got returned a box of my dad's camera gear because my dad was into uh, uh, photography also. And because we were trying to sell some of it because he had so much, you know, when he passed some years ago. Anyway, some of the stuff that didn't sell, he had like macro bellows. He had macro like when he was doing it, they had these, um, not rings, but tubes. So he had them like stacked six deep. I don't know what he was, I, to this day, I don't know what he was photographing, but it was macro, macro, macro. And so, and, and he was a man who loved to think about things, examine things. He was his, his work title when he was in the corporate world, world was director of research, director of research and development. And he just had that kind of mind. And I was raised that way. So I have a tendency to want to examine things and see things up close and find the fine threads that explain why, and then make them big and then go, so where do you fit and how do you affect everything else? So it's like drawing them out and then weaving it back in again. That's how my brain works. So for me, macro is like a visual version of that. If I love that. Sense. You know, and the, the, you, you, you and I had a conversation about this um, last week. In fact, we were talking about it. And I wanted to reiterate it here because something you said really resonated with me. Not that everything that you say doesn't resonate. <laughs> um, <What? but laughs> you, said, you were talking about, because we were talking about the technicalities and the technical side of macro. And I think the gist was a lot of macro photos out there celebrate the fact that they're macro photos, right? It's like, look at this butterfly wing. You've never seen it like this before, or look mm -hmm. at this mundane thing, but super close. It looks really interesting. And it's about, it's about that. It's about the art form, not the art itself. And what, what you were talking about, I think, uh, not to put words in your mouth, but it sounded like you were talking more about exploring, like you said, that thread 
of connective tissue into that story that that macro shot, whether the pixels are taken up close or far away, it's still that macro shot. Can you go into that a little bit, like your kind of philosophy around that? Yeah. So um, if I'm understanding, because <laughs> we talk about so many things, I'm like, which <laughs> thing did I say about macro? Um, well, I mean, it's, I remember one, so one of the things, I, I hope this addresses it, but as you were talking, this this struck me, yeah. and I'm, I'm wondering if this is too, I don't know, it's not private, but per, not personal, but like, you know how when you fall in love with somebody and the first time you come close to them, right? And you didn't really, you knew they were like, you loved them or you had this feeling and you come close and all of a sudden there's like the breath, you, not their bad breath, but I mean, you can, you can sense them breathing and you can sense their skin and there's just things about them that you didn't, you know, experience until you got that close. So it's very sensual mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, sexual probably between humans, but I mean, it, it's, it's very sensual touch sensory um awakening and it's heightened right so i always have a thing about awe because that's a heightened state that shifts your consciousness so in that sense um there's it's like the brush of the skin and the um and the and the closeness and the and the and the shape of the jaw and the art of conveying that feeling visually is a lot of what I talk about. And I don't know if that addresses what you were wanting to hear. It um, does, yeah. But it's also you're talking about the intimacy of it, right? Really, yeah. really intimate, yeah. And mm -hmm. and it's, and it's some, you know, I think an entry point into macro is the fascination with what things look like up close because it's fascinating. And a lot of people get into focus stacking and really, you know, mm -hmm. like create the whole world almost 3D. And that's fascinating. Um, but for me, the... The love of it and the feeling of it and the i mean it's always about consciousness for me the con the, the shift and the awe is choosing making that whole string of decisions about depth of field and where you're going to focus it and how you're going to angle the light and everything um so that it creates this intimate story that is allows you to fall in love with the subject in a whole new way not you, just admire it because, oh, look at all the detail, but, uh -huh. oh, it's like it loves the sun, you know, or something right. like that. And it has the story thing is what I what I want to get my brain around, because, you know, you could tell a story like with a with a portrait photograph, for yeah. example. You know, mm -hmm. you're doing a portrait in that the depending on your model and the goal of that shot, whether it's editorial or fashion or just portrait, you know, whatever mm -hmm. you can you can evoke a certain emotion by the pose and the look and the, you know, the dress and is he or she looking seductive or angry or what do you, so you can kind of weave a story and where you're put, where you place the person, they're looking okay. out of a window with a nightgown on and winds blowing on them that evokes a certain kind of mood. When you translate that to macro, how do I translate that level of storytelling into a macro verse? where I'm telling that kind of, you know, that that detail and it's not about the f-stop shutter speed ISO bellows extension tubes focus stacking and all that stuff. Right, right, right. Well, so the way I so everybody's going to have their way of doing it. Personally, yeah. the way I learned to do it was so I'm a landscape photographer, right? So it's a lot of times you're sitting around, you know, waiting for your shot, let's say. And then, well, what am I going to do while I'm waiting for the light? And you look around and you go, wow, there's a whole bunch of little stories in here. So you, so you dive in. When I actually go out seeking macros, let's, let's use flowers, right? Because that's pretty common. Let's use flowers as an example. Um, I mean, and one thing you can do is create a yard or a pot or a place or an area and plant the kind of stuff you want to photograph. <laughs> and then you can... You know, you talked about you have the lighting. Well, you have the sun. So you either wait for the time of day or you arrange, you know, where the the flower is living. I always I like to do it like here it, where I live. It's pretty in the morning, but it's gorgeous in the afternoon. So the morning light is, doesn't have the same quality as the afternoon light. So I always know that it's always going to be coming from this one angle. So I'll watch my subjects, right? And I'll watch the nightgown in the window and when it's just right. And unlike directing a model, you physically have to get in the position, right? I, I like to handhold. That's, that makes it really organic and 
you know, um, intimate and feely for me. And I like that. And so I will find my angle and my aspect ratio in my camera and try to get just that. And it's like, they're talking. So I get the light and maybe I get a light ray if it's in the right place or bounce it off a pedal, or sometimes it's backlit side lit. Um, because I, I often think about those kinds of model shoots, um, and that beautiful, like a whispered, you know, the diaphanous gown and then a moment passed, you know, <laughs> that whole thing. And, yeah. and I think about those things with flowers or really anything. I love it. I love it. Hey, and I'm in, I'm in California. So, you know, you talk about planting stuff. There's maybe I'll go get some cannabis plants and plant those, <laughs> do some shots. You can, you totally can. And there's a whole bunch of different things you can do. And so the decisions then that go into it are because it, those kinds of things, you know, they're, 3D, they got some depth of field. So then you have yeah. the reason focus stacking interests people is because they want to see more of the flower. I like the challenge of going, but where is the story? Where yeah. is it the strongest? Um, and then how do I choose? And it's like this whole little science thing because you're going, now there's the story. Now do I focus on the, the stamen of the flower or the petal? And then if I focus on the petal, do I lose this other part? Then I got to, you know, uh, um, you know, have a, the aperture so that it has more depth of field, then is it too much background? And, you know, so you, that's why you really have to think about the story because you're like, does it ruin the story if it's a little more in focus or is there something cool that happens back there? What happens to the bokeh? And, yeah. you know, and there's usually yeah, a sweet spot. It's so interesting that you, so you have to be with this, normally photographers, you know, I would argue most creative disciplines, but in this context, photography, you have to be uh, kind of plugged in, especially if you're shooting, you're doing model photography or people photography, you got to be plugged in psychologically to the, to the person, mm -hmm. make that connection. And it's a partnership of, of creativity between you and the subject, because if your subject's all uptight and scared of the camera, you're not going to get the shot. So it, it's a collaboration there. So the photographer has to be a psychologist somewhat on that side or at least empathetic and then also a technician because you got to understand everything you yeah. just talked about the f stop shutter speed depth of field moving your can all that stuff you translate that into say going back to that cannabis tongue-in-cheek example so <laughs> you could taking a photo of a of a cannabis plant or a bud or something and you're up close most people never get to see that up close right so right. that in and of itself is interesting it would make an interesting photo we get some likes on instagram whatever right but if you want to take the karen hutton route and you're taking a picture of that thing how would you like what story would unfold from that other than the clinical forensic kind of shot of well the, so you know how you know, all right so i would go why am you know why like let's say it's a job let's say i've got a job now i've got to shoot this cannabis plant for a client and mm -hmm. um and i and you know this happens like in voiceover sometimes too you get handed a script and you're like oh my god what am i going to do with this because <laughs> you know, you're just not feeling it or whatever and right. i'm going to take that route because you do the same thing in all cases, whether you're shooting a person client, voiceover job, or the cannabis plant for a client. Um, you, you have to go like, what what is the point? Why am I doing it? So you so we want to show, or or you got to make this story up. Um, we want to show the softer side of cannabis. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. And so so I get as much information as I can in my head. Then I sit there and I look at it and like look at it in different light and kind of move around it and look down and kind of try to, cause like, what do you do when you have a client, you watch how the light bounces off. You watch, like there's a saying, I love, I love the way the light reflects your soul. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And so you try to find that spot where the light reflects the soul of who or what or whatever you do. And I love playing the game where I, I know how to do that in nature because that's what I've been doing, you know, whether it's a full on landscape or whether it's a macro, it doesn't matter to me. I do the same thing, but what's really fun is to go like, go and try to do the same thing in your fork drawer in your kitchen yeah. or do it, you know, like an apple or a still life or something and find ways to, you know, create that same thing. It's a discipline just like anything else. 
Yeah. So the yeah. more you can learn to see how light washes and reflects and brushes and creates, it's like a dance, you know, yeah. all these that, little photon streams interact so with one another. You're taking a photo and the client says, um, I want this photo and it, whatever the product can, it was whatever, you know, it, but the, I want this photo to evoke a feeling of well-being, right? Mm -hmm. This particular, this particular strain is known for its whatever it makes people feel safe and like, you know, all this. And we have this other thing over here, this other one that it is the opposite of that. Right. And we need you to create a photo, a yin yang kind of photo of each one. So those, that direction is going to dictate what you do as a photographer. So on this one, I'm going to use extreme shallow depth of field and maybe, you know, it's going to be a little soft and vignetted and whatever. And this mm -hmm. one, I'm going to use hard light and boom, boom, boom. But it's still, you're still shooting macro photography mm -hmm. in the end. So that's, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. That's mm -hmm. really interesting. So and that's, and you mentioned earlier about, you know, telling a story and that's how, I mean, stories have a context so a lot of people, like I see an awful lot of macro photography that is, it's like, it's like, it's like stunt photography, you know, you know, it's like, I took a close up of a picture and I'm like, I've got a picture of a flower, I took a close up of a, of a flower. And you're like, good stunt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but what's it mean? So, I mean, right. some people, you know, some people find the meaning in like having and being, you know, every single molecule of the depth of a, you name it, whatever flower, whatever the subject is. Mm -hmm. And that ha has a certain kind of effect. It sure does. I'm just, I just feel over, overdone and overbaked with technology. And, and I, you know, for me, photography is as much, I have to feel good as anything. And so what it takes to do some of these um, more technical styles of photography isn't really appealing to me, but stories are. And I also like to shoot the way my eye sees and my, mm. Mm, I guess it's a combination of how my eyes see and my senses sense because your eye doesn't take in, but that's part of why, you know, super wide photography is interesting and why focus stacked or super clear, you know, that kind of thing is because it's extended beyond what you can see. I like right. to focus on what my eye sees and the way my mind works and the way my senses work and move. Um, because that's what I want to imbue in my images is that experience. So I love the sense of, of feeling awestruck mm -hmm. by nature or light or the interplay. And, um, and so I try to find those moments where I see just enough is in focus and the rest kind of fades. Like when it comes to macro, I, this is one of the things I like to do a lot. And then just where the light goes oh, like that and you go, oh, and then boom, that's the picture. Yeah. And because it's a, it's an energy stream and a photo, you know, it's like a, the, I don't know if it's literally photon, but you know, like particle accelerators, right. Are affected by who's in the room and who's around it because they've determined now that thought, emotion and expectation somewhat alters the flow of particle accelerators yeah. and the, and the result at the other end. One, one thing, and you know, it's interesting what you unpack there because you, it, a lot of it depends on the motivation of the photographer, yeah. right? Because, because some photographers may, you know, the, the goal is the, the technicality, you know, kind of like a Rubik's cube. It's like, I just love solving these problems. I love figuring out how to do the focus stacking. I, it's the journey of being able to figure right. that stuff out. That is the product, right. you know, they, they want to, it's a puzzle. It's like playing these little games on your phone or whatever. You know, you, you do them because they bring you joy. Just the act right. of doing it brings you joy. And then there's other people like you, for example, that, that may do some of that, but the gist it's weighted towards the other side of those things and understanding how to do those things are in service of the story. Yes. Right. It's like yes. Batman, Batman practicing throwing his, his little batarang thing, right. He's doing it over and over again to get good at it he gets good at that particular thing in order for when he goes into battle against some supervillain, he mm -hmm. knows how to throw it. Right. So you build exactly. the tools. Yeah. You build the tools so that you can execute to what you want to do. That's interesting. Cause we know, so how would you guide photographers that are just embarking on this journey? Right. They're just now saying, yo, this macro thing is really interesting. I'm excited about it. How would you, guide them into like, okay, this is what you do first. And this is how you kind of approach my, 
my version of this kind of photography? Well, I mean, first I would have them explore, um, and which interestingly you can do with a telephoto lens, explore depth of field and explore um, what it's like to, you know, pick pick a subject, pick a focus, and then, you know, figure out bokeh, what bokeh is all about and what that does. Because part of it is the composition. Most people, most people by and large put too much in their frame. And they don't mm -hmm. think enough about what the real subject is and what the real, you know, and it's, and it's a commitment. So, you know, and I tend to think in a more of a fine art sort of way. Um, so I want to really make that choice in camera if I can. Um, and not think about cropping later because the, what do you call it? The, like the planes are different, you know, when you crop right. later versus when you, when you get it just right in the, it's just different. It just looks different, yeah, especially with that. macro lenses because their, their blades are different and the way they see are, is just different from, you know, any other lens. Yeah. And all this stuff that we're talking about, oh, this is a perfect segue point to you are doing an event with. I am. With, with our mutual friend Scott Kelby yep. over there, this this outdoor photography conference. What's that about? What's the deal there? So basically, um, they, you know, we've all learned different ways to present information over the past year. And so Kelby won. Um, we used to do things more in, in person. Well, what they've what they've done in this past year is taken the the different genres and interest areas of photography and created conferences and brought in instructors to teach different aspects of, um, like I did a, one for travel and I did one for landscape. This one upcoming is um, outdoor photography. So it covers, you know, just a different um, set of things. And there's a bunch of really wonderful instructors, um, you know, Rick Salmon and Dave Black and Scott, and, and I'm teaching a class on macro. Yeah. So I'm really excited about it because most of the other things are all, you know, kind of big and I'm doing the one that you know, brings it right in here. <laughs> yeah. And so it's going to be fun. So I'm going to go into all of this and, and not so much into the, you know, focus stacking, super technical, uh, you know, techno crane end of things. I'm going to go into storytelling, how I like to approach it. And then also people who are starting out a lot of times are unsure about, you know, spending the money on a macro lens. And, and when I started, I did it all on telephoto lens and mm -hmm. then determined that I liked it well enough that I wanted to make the investment. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. and then we're how to work at home and how to, how to, um, you know, it's a, you romance, you just sort of romance your world with macro. With, with this conference that's coming up. So I'm looking at the page now it's at, mm -hmm. uh, kelby one live.com i'll put a link to this in the in the, the youtube description and in the blog post but it's kelby one live.com slash outdoor dash conference and people can get to maybe i'll make a short link for it this week in photo.com slash kelby or something like that yeah um, but but the tell the dates it looks like this is it's a couple it is, of days right? yeah it's two days it's it's may 18th and 19th and the way they do it is they run two tracks so you can choose um, you know, so like every hour or so they change and then there's lunch break and stuff and they have, you know, uh, uh, an, M, you know an MC kind of making the toss from class to class. And there's usually a little trade show and discounts and all kinds of really cool things that go on because it's, you know, it's like a regular conference. Somehow, I mean, I got to hand it to Scott and the, and the gang because they really make it feel like one of those Kelby One events that is people are positive and upbeat and it's really yeah. warm and welcoming and fun. And, um, the whole thing runs really, really clean. And just, it's a really feel good experience where you walk away with a lot of information. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. really fun to do these and, and participants just seem to love it. And what's, what does it feel like? So it's an outdoor, the, the title of this event is the, the Outdoor Photography Conference, a Kelby Correct. One live online event. So it's online, I'm assuming through a Zoom or a similar platform? Yeah, yeah. So so basically when you sign up, you get, um, you know, you get your credentials and then you have a link you sign into the day of the conference and then you're on the platform and you get to go and it's like being now you're at the facility and you get to go choose the room you want to be in. Okay. And, um, and it's all spelled out and it's really super simple to, to follow. Then on top of it, they're recording everything. And then as a participant, you then have access to all the recordings for a year. 
before That's it all great. goes away. Yeah. And so even if you can't join live, um, but you know you want to do it, you can still join up and it's like a 50% discount right now. And uh, and you even if you didn't show up for the two days, you can still do it for a year. I love that. You know, one mm -hmm. thing, Scott Kilby, if you're watching this right now, congratulations and thank yep. you for creating a downloadable PDF guide to the the conference schedule that's one thing that i always notice missing from these conferences like just show me where everything is and when it's happening right. on what day so i can draw circles around the things i want to make sure i go to instead of making it virtual and i got to go to a page and scroll and figure stuff out yeah i that's and scott scott and team are they're kind of the ogs when it comes to events right so you you expect a certain level of quality with these things when they put them together so yeah i'm, I'm excited to attend it i'll be there yeah in it's the gonna be fun to you're gonna be heckling <laughs> i'm gonna be heckling i'm bringing my fruit <laughs> so, <laughs> rotten fruit Go my heckle that. fruit <laughs> yeah i'll be in the back screaming out things so uh, you think you're funny karen hutton <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that's, that's so the one, you know, thing? that's the one thing in the virtual world I miss is that we don't actually have people throwing fruit and heckling from no, the back. No one throws fruit at you. No, I know nobody ever does. But it is it is always fun to be in a big room of people, you know, cheering and being enthusiastic. And, and they are you get it. You just it just comes in in different channels. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. It's different. Yeah. yeah Cause in an, in a room you can see eyes and yeah. you know, feel the energy waning and know when to pick up the pace and or, right. You know, exactly. I know you're flying blind a little bit as a presenter. However, in, as a participant, you know, you got the chat and you, the chat is usually just going like a mile right. a minute. And right. Which you don't have in a real life event. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So once again, this, this event is, I'm looking at the page now. It looks like He's got to come a day early on Monday, May 17th for a bonus pre-conference sessions. Um, so that looks pretty cool. Rick Salmon and Larry Becker are doing things. Mm -hmm. And then the actual event starts on Tuesday, May 18th. It goes through uh, Wednesday, May 19th, and then conclude. I think that's it, right? So Yeah, it concludes on the 19th. And the nice thing the about the um, pre-conference session, there's an orientation session, which I think is just so yeah. smart and considerate. Yep. Uh, so that you can, you know, get in there and get some direction and ask questions and um, find out the lay of the land because they do run it a little bit differently than other online conferences. It's better, I think. And yeah. then, uh, and then Rick Salmon does, you know, the introduction. What makes a good outdoor photo? And he yeah. would know because he's the godfather of photography. <laughs> he is. You know, Rick Salmon once told me, you know, uh, well, I forget we were talking about so many things with Rick, but he was telling me about getting good at a certain thing, a complex topic. And he used the analogy. He goes, oh, you know how he talks. I mean, Frederick, yeah. how, do, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> <laughs> I could just hear one him saying One bite that. at a time. That's yeah. how you, that's how you learn true. something complex. One bite at a time. And pretty soon the elephant's gone and you got it. So Yeah. So very cool. Very cool. So macro photography, you're tackling this. It's coming up in just a couple of weeks here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I'm excited. Awesome, yeah, Karen. Yeah, me too. In the internet, yeah. people, people want to check out your stuff and see what you're working on and see your work and all that connect with you on social. What's a good yeah. place for me? To go? Well, so my website, my main, like my portal to my world is karenhutton.com. Um, my online art for, you know, prints and things is karenhuttonart.com. And uh, that's, that's pretty much the portal. I'm Karen Hutton on Instagram and pretty much everywhere else I can think of that's important. Um, but I focus more of my attention on Instagram socially. So yeah, I'll see you there. Awesome. All right. We'll see you there. Karen, thank you for doing this. Thanks for sitting <laughs> thank down. You, I know you're busy building this presentation for this <laughs> for this event and getting ready and doing all that. Yep. I, I have to build presentations the night before. I don't know about you. I can't do them weeks in advance. I gotta I gotta build my outline in advance, but then the actual building of it, I can't do it until like a day or maybe two days, but the, the night before feels right to me. I put it really? all together and it's fresh. It's ready to go. It's current. If something happens, you know, that happened that day, I could stick that in the presentation. It comes off with that energy. That's just yeah. the way I want. Yeah, so. I do. I like to do it like this much ahead of time. Like, you know, I think it's actually what a week and a half because I have the outline. I've got to work on, you know, the photos and, and then assemble them and then go, yeah. Okay. That's good. And then put it away. See, I need to be able to put it away and then come back to it and see if it still sings. 
Oh, yeah. Because I, I, it's like my sister used to do art and uh, used to be an artist and she would hold her, her um, paintings up to a mirror because she couldn't see where it wasn't quite right until she saw it like outside of how she normally sees. So for her in the mirror was the way to do it. So for me, I, I, I look at my presentation like two days before I do it and make all my changes then and then I'm ready to go. I love it. I love it. So yeah, difference between you and me. I'm like a microwave dinner. You're like a gourmet dinner. Then you can <laughs> marinate. <laughs> you got to marinate it, then cook it and serve it. Mine is just three minutes. You're good. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of the difference between us. <laughs> That's really good. Hey, That's I'm just yet saying. another. You're like microwaves you know, are efficient though, Karen. I'm just saying you can do a lot. <laughs> You're like the analogy machine. You're like, drop Monday. a quarter in, you get a Frederick analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. It's in there. That's really funny. All right, Karen, we'll leave it right there. Thank you. Thank you for coming on again. Thank you, Frederick. It. I really appreciate it. This is fun. <laughs>